Hey everybody, this is Rhett. Welcome to Statistics. In this video, we'll be looking at strategies for organizing quantitative data. A little bit of a review. A variable is a characteristic of an element which can assume different values for different elements. Variables are classified as qualitative or quantitative. A quantitative variable is a variable that takes numeric values and upon which arithmetical operations may be meaningfully performed. For example, an average should make sense. Quantitative variables can be further classified as discrete or continuous. A discrete variable can take either a finite or a countable number of values, while a continuous variable can take infinitely many values. Remember that if you can count to get the value, it's discrete, and if you have to measure to get the value, it's continuous. Examples of discrete quantitative variables would be the number of interruptions in class, the year you were born, the number of classes you were taking, the number of friends on your Facebook page, your age and years, and how many cups of coffee you have in a week. Examples of continuous quantitative variables would be trunk diameter, as well as the price of tea in China, your student loan amount, how long it takes you to run a mile, and the time that you've been alive. Here's the spreadsheet with the data from my Krispy Kreme slash final exam experiment. The quantitative variables are correct answers, final exam score, height, weight, and age. Height and weight are measured and those are continuous while the other three are discrete. So let's look at some strategies for organizing quantitative data. We need to consider two cases. In the first case, we have discrete quantitative data with very little variety, like we see on the table now. The numbers here are 0, 1, 2, and 3, so it's a short list of whole numbers. The second case involves either discrete quantitative data with a lot of variety, more values than you'd want to list, or continuous quantitative data, which would be more values than you could possibly list. In the table at the bottom of the screen, we see discrete quantitative data. It looks like the values range from zero up into the 90s. Of course, I could list all the whole numbers from zero to 99, but I don't want to take the time to do that. So I'm going to put this in case two. Let's start with a strategy for case one, when we have discrete quantitative data with little variety. Our strategy is to construct a frequency or relative frequency table. In case one, that's a fairly easy task. First, we'll need to sort the data. Then we can list all the values of the variable. We'll count the occurrences of each value. That'll give us the frequency. And then finally, we'll want to check to make sure that the total of our counts equals our sample size. So basically, this is the same strategy that we use for categorical data. Let's look at an example. Here's a table of discrete quantitative data in which there's very little variety. It's a bunch of zeros, ones, twos, and threes. So on the right-hand side, I've made a frequency table. I was able to list the variable values, the numbers 0 through 3, and then count the occurrences of each value, in this case 8, 7, 6, and 4. I'll check to make sure that those add up to 25, which is my sample size. They do, so I'm good to go. So that's our strategy for organizing discrete quantitative data when there's very little varieties, basically when we can list all the values of the variable. For case two, 
we need a different strategy. In this case, there will be more values than we want to list. Consider the table of values at the top of the screen, where we have numbers ranging from 0 to 97. Rather than list all of the numbers from 0 to 97, I want to create classes. Classes represent a range of data values and are used to group the elements in a data set. An example of a class would be 1 through 20. Let's look at some of the vocabulary of classes. The lower class limit of a class equals the smallest value within that class. The table on the right hand side of the screen has classes 1 through 20, 21 through 40, 41 through 60, 61 through 80, and 81 through 100. The lower class limits are the smallest values in each class. In this case, they are 1, 21, 41, 61, and 81. The upper class limit of a class equals the largest value within that class. In the table on the right, the upper class limits are 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. The class width is the difference between the lower class limits of two successive classes. So for example, if we take the first two classes, the successive lower class limits are 1 and 21, and the difference between the two is 20. Let me give you some guidelines for creating classes. Generally speaking, it's a good idea to have between 5 and 20 classes. You want to make sure that the classes are non-overlapping, that your class widths are consistent, and that your class limits are nice numbers. Let me illustrate this actually by giving counterexamples. Here's one strategy in which we have two classes. The first class consists of values 0 through 49, and the second class consists of values 50 through 99. So we'll have just two classes. In this scenario, we end up with too few classes. Remember that our goal is somewhere between 5 and 20. Here's another strategy. The first class is 0 to 20. The second class is 20 to 40. The third is 40 to 60, and so forth. A problem would arise should the value 20 appear in my data set. I won't know if that belongs in the first class or the second class. This strategy involves overlap. To avoid that, I could change my upper class limit in the first class to 19 and the upper class limit in the second class to 39. Here's another strategy. The first class is 1 through 19. The second class is 20 to 39. The third class is 40 to 59. If we look at the class width for the first class, remember that that's the difference between successive lower class limits. Then the first class width is 20 minus 1, or 19. If we look at the difference between the next two successive lower class limits, 40 minus 20, we have a class width of 20. So the first class width is 19, and the second and subsequent class widths are 20. So in this case, the class widths are inconsistent. In a final strategy, the first class is 1 through 18, the second is 19 through 36, the third is 37 to 54, and so forth. I end up with six classes, so that's nice. The first class ends at 18, and the next one begins at 19. The second ends at 36, and the third begins at 37. That pattern continues, so there's no overlap. The class widths are consistent. 19 minus 1 is 18. 37 minus 19 is 18, 
and so forth. However, I don't consider these to be nice numbers. At first glance, it's hard to recognize the pattern and realize that the class widths are 18. A remedy would be to change the first upper class limit to 20, so that the next class would then begin with 21, and the one after that, 41. This is an odd choice of class limits. Creating classes can be tricky. Let me give you a strategy. I strongly recommend that you first order the data least to greatest. That will make it, make it easy to pick out the minimum and the maximum values in your data set. Once you have the minimum and maximum, you can calculate the range. It's the difference between the two, so you'll subtract the minimum from the maximum. Then you need to estimate the number of classes that you will need. Remember that our goal is somewhere between 5 and 20 classes. If you have a small sample, you'll likely want fewer classes. If you have a large sample, you may want more classes. Next, divide the range by the estimate of the number of classes that you'll need, and then round this number. This is your starting class width. The first lower class limit should be less than or equal to the minimum. Keep in mind that your first lower class limit does not always have to equal the minimum. It just has to be less than or equal to the minimum. Successive lower class limits are determined by adding the class width repeatedly. And then finally, you'll choose upper class limits such that overlap is avoided. Let me give you an example. Here's the data set with exam points. I've already ordered the data least to greatest. That makes it easy to see that the minimum is 60 and the maximum is 175. To get the range, I'll subtract the minimum from the maximum and I get 115. I need an estimate for the number of classes that I'll use. So I need a number between 5 and 20. The sample size here is 68, so it's not a huge data set. I'm just going to guess that I might need 8 classes. To get an estimate of class width, I'll start by dividing the range by the number of classes. When I divide 115 by 8, I get 14.375. I'm going to round this to what I consider to be a nice number, 15. The minimum in this data set is 60. That's a nice, even number, and I'm going to use that as my first lower class limit. To get successive class limits, I'll keep adding multiples of 15. So after 60, the next would be 75, then 90, then 105. Now I just need to add upper class limits. I want to make sure that there's no overlap. So for the first class, I'll make sure that it ends at 74. That's before the next class starts at 75. I'll end that class at 89 so that it ends before the next class starts at 90. And here's the finished product. Once we've defined our classes, finishing the frequency or relative frequency table is pretty easy. We need to count the elements in each class and add that to the table. Once we have all the counts, we'll total to make sure that equals our sample size. And then you can add relative frequency if you'd like. In this table, I have eight classes, so I've met the goal of five to 20 classes. There's no overlap. One class ends before the next begins. The class widths are consistent. Notice that as you look down the left-hand side, if you keep adding 15, you'll get the next number. And finally, I consider these to be nice numbers. You can look at the first two class definitions, and it's very easy to recognize the pattern and to continue it on your own. So, I hope this helps with organizing quantitative data. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay real and be rational.